Leo Tolstoy's The Candle. It was in the time of serfdom, many years before Alexander II's liberation of the 62 serfs in 1862. In those days, the people were ruled by different kinds of lords. There were not a few who, remembering God, treated their slaves in a humane manner and not as beasts of burden, while there were others who were seldom known to perform a kind or generous action. But the most barbarous and tyrannical of all were those former serfs who arose from the dirt and became princes. It was this latter class who made life literally a burden to those who were unfortunate enough to come under their rule. Many of them had arisen from the ranks of the peasantry to become superintendents of noblemen's states. The peasants were obliged to work for their master a certain number of days a week. There were plenty of land and water and the soil was rich and fertile, while the meadows and forests were sufficient to supply the needs of both the peasants and their lord. There was a certain nobleman who had chosen a superintendent from the peasantry on one of his other states. No sooner had the power to govern been vested in this newly made official than he began to practice the most outrageous cruelties upon the poor serfs who had been placed under his control. Although this man had a wife and two married daughters and was making so much money that he could have lived happily without transgressing in any way against either God or men. yet. He was filled with envy and jealousy and deeply sunk in sin. Michael Semyonovich began his persecutions by compelling the peasants to perform more days of service on the estate every week than the laws obliged them to work. He established a brickyard in which he forced the men and women to do excessive labor, selling the bricks for his own profit. On one occasion, the overworked serfs sent a delegation to Moscow to complain of their treatment to their lord, but they obtained no satisfaction. When the poor peasants returned disconsolate from the nobleman, their superintendent determined to have revenge for their boldness going above him for redress, and their life and that of their fellow victims became worse than before. It happened that among the serfs there were some very treacherous people who would falsely accuse their fellows of wrongdoing and sow seeds of discord among the peasantry. Whereupon Michael would become greatly enraged while his poor subjects became to live in fear of their lives. When the superintendent passed through the village, the people would run and hide themselves as from a wild beast. Seeing thus the terror which he had struck to the hearts of the Mojiks, Michael's treatment of them became still more vindictive, so that from overwork and ill usage, the lot of the poor serfs was indeed a hard one. There was a time when it was possible for the peasants, whom driven to despair, to devise means whereby they could rid themselves of inhumane monster such as Semyonovich, and so these unfortunate people began to consider whether something could be done to relieve them of their intolerable yoke. They would hold little meetings in secret places to bewail their misery and to confer with one another as to which would be the best act. Now and then the boldest of the gathering would rise and address his companions in this strain. How much longer can we tolerate such a villain to rule over us? Let us make an end of it at once, for it were better for us to perish than to suffer. It is surely not a sin to kill such a devil in human form. It happened once, before the Easter holidays, the one of these meeting was held in the woods, where Michael had sent the serfs to make a clearance for their master. At noon they assembled to eat their dinner and to hold a consultation. Why can't we leave now, said one, 
Very soon we shall be reduced to nothing. Already we are almost worked to death. There being no rest, night or day, either for us or our poor women. If any thing should be done in a way not exactly to please him, he will find fault and perhaps flog some of us to death, as was the case with poor Simeon, whom he killed not long ago. Only recently, Anism was tortured in irons till he died. We certainly cannot stand this much longer. Yes, said another. What is the use of waiting? Let us act at once. Michael will be here this evening and will be certain to abuse us shamefully. Let us then thrust him from his horse and with one blow of an axe give him what he deserves and thus end our misery. We can then dig a big hole and bury him like a dog and no one will know what became of him. Now let us come to an agreement to stand together as one man and not to betray one another. The last speaker was Vasily Minayev, who if possible had sure cause to complain of Michael's cruelty than any of his fellow serfs. The superintendent was in the habit of flogging him severely every week and he took also Vasily's wife to serve him as cook. Accordingly, during the evening that followed the meeting in the woods, Michael arrived on the scene on horseback. He began at once to find fault with the manner in which the work had been done and to complain because some lime trees had been cut down. I told you not to cut down any lime trees, shouted the enraged superintendent. Who did this thing? Tell me at once or I shall flog every one of you. On investigation, a peasant named Sidor was pointed out as the guilty one and his face was roundly slapped. Michael also severely punished Vasily because he had not done sufficient work, after which the master rode safely home. In the evening, the serfs again assembled and poor Vasily said, Oh, what kind of people are we? Anyway, we are only sparrows and not men at all. We agree to stand by each other, but as soon as the time for action comes, we all run and hide. Once a lot of sparrows considered against a hawk, but no sooner did the bird of prey appear than they sneaked off in the grass. Selecting one of the choicest sparrows, the hawk took it away to eat, after which the others came out crying, twee twee, and found that one was missing. Who is killed? they asked. Wanka. Well, he deserved it. You, my friends, are acting in just the same manner. When Michael attacked Sidor, you should have stood by your promise. Why didn't you arise? And which one stroke put an end to him and to our misery? The effect of this speech was to make peasants more firm in their determination to kill their superintendent. The latter had already given orders that they should be ready to plow during the Easter holidays and to sow the field with oats, whereupon the serfs became stricken with grief and gathered in Vasily's house to hold another indignation meeting. If he has really forgotten God, they said, and shall continue to commit such crimes against us, it is truly necessary that we should kill him. If not, let us perish, for it can make no difference to us now. This despairing program, however, met with considerable opposition from a peaceably inclined man named Peter Mikhaev. Brethren, said he, you are contemplating a grievous sin. The taking of a human life is very serious matter. Of course it is easy to end the mortal existence of a man, but what will become of the souls of those who commit the deed? If Michael continues to act toward us unjustly, God will punish him, surely. But my friends, we must have patience. This specific utterance only served to intensify the anger of Vasily, said he. Peter is forever repeating the same old story. It is a sin to kill anyone. Certainly, it is sinful to murder, but we should consider the kind of man we are dealing with. We all know it is wrong to kill a good man.
but even God would take away the life of such a dog as he is. It is our duty, if we have any love for mankind, to shoot a dog that is mad. It is a sin to let him live. If, therefore, we are to suffer at all, let it be in the interest of the people, and they will thank us for it. If we remain quiet any longer, a flogging will be our only reward. You are talking nonsense, Mikhaev. Why don't you think of the sin we shall be committing if we work during the Easter holidays? For you will refuse to work then yourself. Well then, replied Peter, if they shall send me to plow, I will go. But I shall not be going of my own free will, and God will know whose sin it is and shall punish the offender accordingly. Yet we must not forget him. Brethren, I am not giving you my own views only. The law of God is not to return evil for evil. Indeed, if you try in this way to stamp out wickedness, it will come upon you all the stronger. It is not difficult for you to kill the man, but this blood will surely stain your own soul. You may think you have killed a bad man, that you have gotten rid of evil, but you will soon find out that seeds of still greater wickedness have been planted within you. If you yield misfortune, it will surely come to you. As Peter was not without sympathizers among the peasants, the poor serfs were consequently divided into two groups, the followers of Vasily and those who held the views of Mikhaev. On Easter Sunday, no work was done. Toward the evening, an elder came to the peasants from the nobleman's court and said, Our superintendent, Michael Semyonovich, orders you to go tomorrow to plough the fields for oats. Thus the official went through the village and directed the men to prepare for work the next day, some by the river and others by the roadway. The poor people were almost overcome with grief. Many of them shedding tears, but none dared to disobey the orders of their master. On the morning of Easter Monday, while the church bells were calling the inhabitants to religious services, and while everyone else was about to enjoy a holiday, the unfortunate serfs started for the field to plough. Michael arose rather late and took a walk about the farm. The domestic servants were through their work and had dressed themselves for the day, while Michael's wife and their widowed daughter, who was visiting them as was her custom on holidays, had been to church and returned. A streaming semiver awaited them, and they began to drink tea with Michael, who, after lighting his pipe, called the elder to him. Well said, the superintendent. Have you ordered the mojiks to plough today? Yes, sir, I did, was the reply. Have they all gone to field? Yes, sir, all of them. I directed them myself where to begin. That is all very well. You gave the orders, but are they ploughing? Go at once and see, and you may tell them that I shall be there after dinner. I shall expect to find one and a half acres done for every two ploughs and the work must be well done, otherwise they shall be severely punished, notwithstanding the holiday. I hear, sir, and obey. The elder started to go, but Michael called him back. After hesitating for some time, as if he felt very uneasy, he said, By the way, listen to what those scoundrels say about me. Doubtless some of them will curse me, and I want you to report the exact words. I know what villains they are, they don't find work at all pleasant. They would rather lie down all day and do nothing. They would like to eat and drink and make merry on holidays. But they forget that if the ploughing is not done, it will soon be too late. So you go and listen to what is said and tell it to me in detail. Go at once. I hear sir and obey, turning his back and mounting his horse. The elder was soon at field, where the serfs were at work. It happened that Michael's wife, a very good-hearted woman, overheard the conversation which her husband had just been holding with the elder. Approaching him, she said, My good friend, 
Michael, I beg of you to consider the importance and solemnity of this holy day. Do not sin, for Christ's sake. Let the poor mujiks go home. Michael laughed, but made no reply to his wife's humane request. Finally, he said to her, "You have not been whipped for a very long time, and now you have become bold enough to interfere in affairs that are not your own." Minishka, she persisted. I have had a frightful dream concerning you. You had better let the mojiks go. Yes, said he. I perceive that you have gained so much flesh of late that you think you would not feel the whip. Look out! Rudely thrusting his hot pipe against her cheek, Michael chased his wife from the room. After which he ordered his dinner. After eating a hearty meal consisting of cabbage soup. roast pig meat cake pastry with milk jelly sweet cakes and vodka he called his woman cook to him ordered her to be seated and sing songs semyonovich accompanying her on the guitar while the superintendent was thus enjoying himself to the fullest satisfaction in the musical society of his cook the elder returned and making a low bow to his superior proceeded to give the desired information concerning the serfs well asked michael did they plow yes replied the elder they have accomplished about half the field is there no fault to be found not that i could discover the work seems to be very well done they are evidently afraid of you how is the soil very good it appears to be quite soft well said simeonovich after a pause What did they say about me? Cursed me, I suppose. As the elder hesitated somewhat, Michael commanded him to speak and tell him the whole truth. Tell me all, said he. I want to know their exact words. If you tell me the truth, I shall reward you. But if you conceal anything from me, you will be punished. See here, Catherine. Pour out a glass of vodka and give him courage. After drinking to the health of his superior. the elder said to himself it is not my fault if they do not praise him i shall tell him the truth then turning suddenly to the superintendent he said they complain michael simeonovich they complain bitterly but what did they say demanded michael tell me well one thing they said was he does not believe in god michael laughed who said that he asked it seemed to be their unanimous opinion he has been overcome by the evil one they said very good laughed the superintendent but tell me what each of them said what did vasily say the elder did not wish to betray him but he had a certain grudge against vasily and he said he cursed you more than did any of the others but what did he say it was awful to repeat sir vasily said he shall die like a dog having no chance to repent oh the villain exclaimed michael he would kill me if he were not afraid all right vasily we shall have an encounting with you and tishka he called me a dog i suppose well said the elder they all spoke of you in anything but complimentary terms but it is mean in me to repeat what they said mean or not you must tell me i say some of them declared what your back should be broken semyonovich appeared to enjoy this immensely for he laughed outright we shall see whose back will be the first to be broken said he was that tishka's opinion while i did not suppose they would say anything good about me i did not expect such curses and threats and peter mikhayev was the fool cursing me too no he did not curse you at all he appeared to be the only silent one among them mikhayev is a very wise mojik and he surprises me very much at his actions all the other peasants seem amazed what did he do he did something remarkable he was diligently plowing and as i approached him i heard someone singing very sweetly looking between the plowshares i observed a bright object shining well what was it hurry up It was a small 5 kopek wax candle burning brightly and the wind was unable to blow it out. 
Peter, wearing a new shirt, sang beautiful hymns as he plowed. And no matter how he handled the implement, the candle continued to burn. In my presence, he fixed the plow, shaking it violently, but the bright little object between the coulters remained undisturbed. And what did Mikhayev say? He said nothing, except when on seeing me, he gave me the holy day salutation, after which he went on his way singing and plowing. I did not say anything to him, but on approaching the other mojiks, I found that they were laughing and making sport of their silent companion. It is a great sin to plow on Easter Monday, they said. You could not get absolution from your sin if you were to pray all your life. And did Mikhayev make no reply? He stood long enough to say, There should be peace on earth and good will to men. After which he resumed his plowing and slinging, the candle burning even more brightly than ever. Semyonovich had now ceased to ridicule and putting aside his guitar, his head dropped on his breast and he became lost in thought. Presently he ordered the elder and the cook to depart, after which Michael went behind a screen and threw himself upon the bed. He was sighing and moaning as if in great distress. When his wife came in and spoke kindly to him, he refused to listen to her, exclaiming, He has conquered me and my end is near. Minishka said the women, Arise and go to the mojiks in the field. Let them go home and everything will be all right. Here, to four, you have run far greater risks without any fear, but now you appear to be very much alarmed. He has conquered me, he repeated. I am lost. What do you mean? Demeaned his wife, angrily. If you will go and do as I tell you, there will be no danger. Come, Minishka, she added, tenderly. I shall have the saddle horse brought for you at once. When the horse arrived, the women persuaded her husband to mount the animal and to fulfill her request concerning the serfs. When he reached the village, a woman opened the gate for him to enter, and as he did so the inhabitants, seeing the brutal superintendent whom every day feared, ran to hide themselves in their houses, gardens, and other secluded places. At length Michael reached the gate, which he found closed also, and, being unable to open it himself, while seated on his horse, he called loudly for assistance. As no one responded to his shouts, he dismounted and opened the gate. But as he was about to remount and had one foot in the stirrup, the horse became frightened at some pigs and sprang suddenly to one side. The superintendent fell across the fence and a very sharp picket pierced his stomach. When Michael fell unconscious to the ground, toward the evening, when the serfs arrived at the village gate, their horses refused to enter. On looking around, the peasants discovered the dead body of their superintendent lying face downward in a pool of blood, where he had fallen from the fence. Peter Mikhayev alone had sufficient courage to dismount and approach the prostrate form. His companions, riding around the village and entering by the way of the backyards, Peter closed the dead man's eyes after which he put the body in a wagon and took it home. When the nobleman learned of the fatal accident which had befallen his superintendent and of the brutal treatment which he had meted out to those under him, he freed the serfs, exacting a small rent for the use of his land and the other agriculture opportunities. And thus the peasants clearly understood that the power of God is manifested not in evil, but in goodness.